Welcome to this month's episode of Fraud Talk, the ACFE's monthly podcast. I'm Mandy Moody, social media specialist here. And today I have John Gill, the VP of Education here at the ACFE, and Alan Bachman, the Education Manager here at the ACFE. We're going to talk about a topic we see pretty frequently in the news and then around conference time for us this Uh, gets brought up on some of our social media outlets, but what we can learn from fraudsters, if anything, and um, the value of hearing from a fraudster in person or through an interview. So let's start with you, John. You have taught for the ACFE for many years, and I've heard many fraudsters speak over the course of that time. What do you think is the value in hearing a fraudster speak about his crime firsthand versus reading a case file or a court report or reading a news story? Well, Mandy, first, thank you for having me. And this is a good topic, and it is uh, especially important around annual conference time. And we do, there is some controversy about allowing fraudsters to speak, either on camera or at live events. But I've talked, done several interviews with fraudsters, and after sitting and talking to them, I believe that that is the only way to really understand what happened in any particular case. You can read the case file, you can read the news reports, but they always start and stop, well, here's here are just the facts. Here's what happened. They, you know, stole $50,000. They were doing a, you know, check tampering scheme or they stole cash or it was a false billing scheme. Uh, They were caught by a tip from somebody within the company. They confessed, they pleaded guilty, and they got two years in prison. And that's really all that you know about it. But to me, what's more interesting is trying to understand, well, what motivated this person to do this in the first place? Why did these people, who in all other respects are law-abiding citizens, they pay their taxes, uh, they obey all the other rules and laws, why did they go so far as to steal from their employer? And so that's why I believe you can really get some insight into people's motivations by sitting down and talking to them in an interview. Also, using the if people watch the interviews that we do, they can get a better understanding of the motivations and I think that helps them when they're doing uh, admission-seeking interviews with the actual suspect because if you can't develop some type of rapport with them, if you can't kind of figure out what might have been motivating them, what were the things that led them to do this, then I just don't think you can, you're as effective in getting a confession. So if you can sit down and talk to these people, it makes a lot of sense. And here's another example I thought was very interesting because I had read um, a lot about Mark Whitaker. He was the fraudster who was involved with the Archer Daniels Midland fraud. I had met him at a continual legal education seminar and had invited him to come and speak. And so I, before when we did a video interview with him, and beforehand, I read all this information, and I thought I knew the case pretty well. But there, were, there was one question I really never did understand, because the, 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 most of the movie, the informant is talking about him wearing a wire to record conversations for the FBI as part of a price-fixing investigation. So he wore a wire and worked with the FBI for two, uh, two and a half years. But while this was going on, he was engaging in his own scheme. I think it was a phony billing scheme where he stole what they think was over $9 million from ADM. And so as I'm reading this and thinking about it beforehand, I'm thinking that makes no sense whatsoever. How did you not think that you weren't going to go to jail while you're being an informant for the FBI at the same time, you're stealing all of this money. And so when we were doing the interview, I just asked him, I said, Mark, what were you thinking? You had to know that this was not going to end well. And he said, well, in hindsight, yes, it didn't make a lot of sense and most people don't understand, but you have 
to look at it from my point of view. A few years before all this price fixing investigation started, they caught the treasurer of the company stealing money. And he stole about two to three million dollars. But instead of prosecuting him, they didn't want the bad publicity, they didn't want anybody to know about it, so they simply fired him and let him go. They didn't even ask for the money back. So he said, I'm thinking, you know, here I am in a similar position, I'm president of the company, and if I'm stealing this money, they're not gonna want the bad publicity, so they're probably just going to fire me, but I'll get to keep the money because I know I'm going to lose my job one way or another, and at least if I'm able to you know, safeguard this $9 million, my family will have something to live on if I lose my job. And he said, that's what was going on in my head. Now, in retrospect, he says, that probably wasn't a good plan, but on some level, trying to get in his head, it did make some sense. They had a history of just let's fire them, we don't want the money back, let's just, you know, hush it up. And he's thinking the same thing, even though, you know, he's wearing a wire and he's stealing money from the company, he's thinking, well, he'll still keep, keep the money if, if they find him out. And that's something that you could never quite understand by reading any of the reports, because that's something that only he could explain. Talking to the fraudsters really helps the fraud examiner understand the emotions, the, the twisted logic that they go through in deciding to take the money in the first place, and then also what they go through in concealing it. So that kind of goes into um, my next question for you, Alan. You know, for CFEs, fraud investigators that are in the audience or on the other side of the screen watching these interviews, as a fraud examiner, what are you looking for, you know, when, you, when you're hearing a fraudster tell his or her story? What, um, are there any characteristics that are similar when, you know, last year when we all sat there and heard Andrew Fastow from Enron or the year before Mark Whitaker, what, what are you looking for when they're speaking? Well, I take two approaches. Uh, to this. One is the approach I take when I talk to fraudsters in the past as a fraud examiner was I'm not really interested in your motivation. We already know you did it. Uh, a ju judicial system or civil process will take over from here. If you have something you want to say to me about this and, and explain your motivation, I'm willing to listen to it. But what I'm what my approach to that in, in the time when I was doing fraud examinations was if they steal, they will lie. They will, they will justify, justify, justify. The other side of that, the role I have now as education manager, now we have a chance to basically look backwards through the telescope. We get a chance to look at this uh, fraud in hindsight. We get to ask these, uh, these people who have perpetrated their crime, who have done their penalties, who have gone to jail, paid restitution, or are still paying restitution, to tell us the story. And the story we're looking for, and this is what we get from our interviews with fraudsters, and this is what we get at our conferences, the story we get from the fraudster is, as much as we can get, the unvarnished truth. Now, we're not, we don't have a problem at all if they come out there and lie through their teeth, because the, our audience is composed of people who can tell that this is, we're, this is a whitewash. And we've had fraudsters who've come out there and kind of glossed over some of their crimes. Uh, you almost want to prompt them and remind them, what about this other time? But what the people are in the, our audience are hearing is a good example of how I did it, why I did it, how I got away with it, how I almost got caught. These are the types of things we ask them to talk about. And what happened when I got caught? The relief, finally I've been caught. Um, I think one of the best explanations I've ever heard from a fraudster that I've spoken to personally was, I don't know what I was thinking. No excuse, no justification, no family crisis, no drama of any kind. I just don't know what I was thinking. I took the money uh, and I kept taking it and I kept spending it. But I, had, I don't have any excuse. 
and that, that was probably one of the most interesting answers I've ever heard because, as I said, when I was a fraud examiner, a lot of the fraudsters would be like, well, I've got this drama, I've got this crisis, uh, I've got this other thing going on, and I need to, I'm, I'm going to make it right. I mean, they have lots of excuses and lots of explanations. And they haven't really had a chance to reflect on really what they've done. The fraudsters we bring into our conference, some high level, some very low level, have their unique story to tell, and they've had time to kind of reconcile themselves to it. So we're not going to put words in your mouth, but these, these are your words. And that educational component for our attendees is unmatched because people will, you will be able to tell what they're saying, how they're saying it, what they did. Was there something special here that we need to pay attention to? And that benefit can't be uh, uh, underestimated. So as you both know, and Alan, you um, actually are in charge of finding these people, but every year at our ACFE Global Fraud Conference, we hear from a convicted fraudster during the closing keynote address. Um, we get mixed reviews about this. So why do you think this is such a controversial topic? In the last couple of years, we've had a lot of controversy. We had Andrew Fastow last year, and we, um, we I kind of monitored all the pushback that we got on that on our website, in our discussion forums, and on LinkedIn and a couple of other places. And the people there had a sense of outrage. And their sense of outrage was, in my opinion, somewhat uninformed because they did not understand the value that we place on this type of session. Most of the people who were expressing the outrage had never even attended one of our conferences, had never seen this, this in action, had never really witnessed how a person, and these are not easy sessions to do. I do not envy the fraudster in the least for cutting up there and, and, and talking to 2,500, 3,000 people and saying, this is my story. I screwed up big time. I went to jail. It ruined my family. Here's pictures of my kids. We've had fraudsters put their pictures of their children up there. And I think the people who are most critical are the ones that are most uninformed about that because of the value. For two and a half days, we have anti-fraud education from subject matter experts and professionals from around the world. And this is the one chance to hear from the other side, the people, who, the, pers the people or persons who've got away with it for a time and how they did. And uh, a lot of those people are vilified. We've had people walk out, of, walk out of our sessions. But very often, we've had a lot of people come up at the end of the session to speak directly to the fraudster, to talk to them, and, and actually thank them for for their honesty and candor, which I find remarkable. Um, it happened with Fastow, it happened with uh, Mark Whitaker, and it's happened with some of our, as I say, lower level fraudsters, people who committed pedestrian uh, frauds, if you will, not of the Fastow, Fastow or Mark Whitaker variety. So it, it provides a tremendous value uh, in, in terms of its educational component. People uh, get upset because we glamorize. Uh, we never glamorize. We, and uninten we unintentionally humanize, but we do not glamorize these people in any, in any shape or form. And we make that very, very clear in our introductions. And it, like I say, this is not an easy place to be for them. Uh, but it does get that human element out. It, these are people too. You're not looking for a grand mastermind. You're looking for somebody who is just like you. And uh, well, very often same, that's over, overlooked. It's the same human element you're looking to achieve in an interview, I imagine. Oh, absolutely. Um, one last question for both of you. And this has been in the news a lot lately. And, you know, Alan, we've talked about old Jordan Belfort um, lately, and we're actually looking forward to hearing from the um, FBI detective who worked on the case uh, and the prosecutor who worked on the case. For those of you listening, that don't know who Jordan Belfort is. He's the the guy that the Wolf of Wall Street is based on, and he ran a huge boiler room fraud, um, and it's been glamorized uh, in the Wolf of Wall Street, and uh, which is kind of why we wanted to get the prosecutor, the FBI detective, those people who worked on the case to look at it that way. But uh, Jordan Belfort is a fraudster who whom, like other fraudsters we've seen, who is now saying that he's reformed and he is uh, a motivator and speaker, whatnot. So that 
that begs the question, and this question came up in our LinkedIn group, which is why it's on my mind. Um, do you think fraudsters can truly reform? The ones that you've met, the top level CFOs like Fastow, to the uh, Diane Katanis who are just, tr you know, doing it to make ends meet or to keep up a lifestyle, but ultimately regretting it and coming forward. Um, do you think that there's reformation there for them? And does it happen? Have you seen it? That's a problem because I, deep down, I like to believe uh, that, you know, most human beings are good. And I, I actually, you know, if you look at the number of frauds that occur versus the number of employees, it's actually a small number. So you have to believe, you know, people are at their core basically good. Unfortunately, the experience I have had with these uh, fraud perpetrators is I am amazed at how many times they did it the first time. We've done interviews with them. They they talk about how extremely sorry they are and what a, and how many, the lesson that they learned from it. And then they turn around and they do it all over again. And I give just a couple of quick examples just from our from the interviews that we had done. I did an interview with a guy named Barry Wedney, and he was a controller for a small firm, and he. Uh, he was in Austin, we sat him down, we did an interview with him, and he talked about how sorry he was that he'd stolen from the company and uh, how much he'd learned, and he actually wanted to start going out and speaking to groups to tell them uh, his story. About six months later, I saw a news story where he had been arrested again. At the very time he had been doing the interview with me, he was working for another company, he did the, exactly the same thing. He was stealing money from them and he got caught and he went back to jail. Steve Komisar, we uh, did an interview with him uh, probably 10 years ago. He, say, it was, he was a con artist. He came out, he went on the uh, speaking circuit, wrote a book about preventing fraud, got caught again. He was back in jail. Barry Minko, back in jail again. It just seems like, uh, and I, uh, Bob Daniels, another guy who he, he actually cried during the interview. Dr. Wells, uh, Joe Wells did the interview and during the interview he started crying and about how sorry he was. And then he got out of jail, somebody gave him a job as a bookkeeper, same thing, started stealing money from him. So the history is not good here and I'm not a psychologist. I wish I knew, understood more about if you really do seem sorry about it, why do you keep going? The closest I can get is a lot of times when we do these interviews, the people say that they got addicted to what they were doing. I think they got addicted to the thrill, they got addicted to having extra money, being able to spend it, and so I think, you know, just like a drug addict, you do it the first time you know that it's bad and you don't want to do it again, but you just have this overwhelming craving to do it. And that's about the best explanation I can have. But that's again something that is when you talk to these people, you start to pick up signs that help explain some of this. It's like as, as they're telling you about what they did, they say, it, well, I, even when the financial crisis was over, they kept doing it anyway because they kind of got addicted to it. Uh, for John's examples, I can counter a little bit. I mean, Mark Whitaker is, I think, rebuilding his life. He's doing some speaking, but he's also head of a, a large company in Florida now. Uh, the last time I, I uh, reached out to him, he was seemed to be doing okay. Aaron Beam went from being a CFO and one of the founders of HealthSouth. Uh, last I heard from Aaron, he had written a book about his, uh, about his uh, exploits, if you will, and was now cutting lawns. He had almost retired to the life of a, a, a gentleman farmer and was uh, cutting lawns and probably will not commit a crime again. Mark probably will not. The propensity is always there though for anybody, even those who haven't so far. It's If you say, well, this is a fraudster and they've committed this crime, will they be good forever? Well, I would counter that with, here's a, here's a good person, will they never commit a fraud? And who's to say? Uh, I try to give everybody the benefit of the doubt, but there's some very obvious ones that, oh no, it's only a matter of time before they transgress again. We see them all the time. 
John's mentioned a couple of them, and there's others we have, we've spoken to in the past, where they've walked out of the room and we look at each other and you go, just a matter of time. Uh, but who's to say? And, uh, you know, there's, gonna, there's more out there we can't wait to talk to because they've got, they've got great stories about how they did what they did. And some of them do end up crossing the line again. Wonderful. Well, thank you both, John and Alan. Yeah. Um, it's a truly interesting topic. I mean, we could talk about this forever. And I know on LinkedIn, they, they could go for months on a topic like this. Um, and we hope to see all of you listening at our annual conference this year. Um, and we will have another fraudster lined up. But we'll also have, you know, for every one fraudster, there's thousands of fraud examiners at the conference. So uh, there's always more of us than them. Um, so thank you both. And thank you for listening to this month's episode of Fraud Talk. You can find all of our Fraud Talk episodes at acfe.com slash podcast. And we will see you next month. <laughs>